Mara, nomás un momentito de su tiempo. Por lo tanto, uh, por favor, este, complete la encuesta y volveremos en un momento. And before we begin, I just want to go over a few instructions about how to participate in today's session. Y antes de empezar, quiero nomás repasar cómo participar en la sesión de hoy. We'll be providing simultaneous interpretation into Spanish so that anybody, everyone can participate in their preferred language. Vamos a, pre a proporcionar interpretación simultánea al español para que cada persona pueda participar en su idioma preferido. For Spanish, you can just click on the globe icon and select ES for Spanish. Para uh, español, nomás puede hacer clic en el icono del globo y um, seleccionar ES para español. And to hear only the interpreter's voice, also click on the blue bar that says mute original audio. Y para oír solo la voz del intérprete, también haga clic en la barra azul que dice mute original audio o silenciar audio original. And in addition to our interpreter, Stella, we also have Beatrice providing bilingual meeting support for us today. Y además de Stella, también tenemos a Beatriz que nos va a apoyar con la uh, traducción escrita hoy día. Beatrice will be translating English questions into Spanish and any typed Spanish questions into English. And we encourage you to share your questions using the Q&A function in English or Spanish throughout the session. Beatriz va a traducir las preguntas del inglés al español y el español al inglés. Y le pedimos que por favor ponga sus preguntas en el botón que dice Q y A, que representa preguntas y respuestas. Um, para uh, ahí poner sus preguntas. Thank you again. I'm Matt Wettstein, the president of Cabrillo. Welcome and thank you for being here. And I've posted again into the chat, a chat feature a survey that we'd like you to take part in at the beginning of our session. Uh, and so before we get started, it's my honor to introduce for uh, an introduction to the, the session uh, one of our board members, Cristina Cuevas, who serves on our, our name exploration subcommittee. So thank you, Cristina, for being here. Gracias, Cristina, por estar aquí con nosotros. Cristina, we are on mute. We can't hear you, so sorry. And Stella, I sorry, I'm sorry. You, we can now go to uh, consecutive interpretation now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for the second of a series of community events examining the origins and impact of the naming of our college after Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. Before we begin, I want to provide a little background on why we're hosting these name exploration events and what we hope to achieve by engaging with you. In July 2020, Cabrillo Board of Trustees received a request to rename the college in response to a widespread national and social unrest and critical analysis of the college's namesake. In recognition of the concerns of our faculty, staff, students, and administrators, we established a process to explore that request. To do this, a board subcommittee was authorized to explore the name of the college and to eventually recommend to the full board a proposal as to whether or not the name should be changed. The subcommittee then assembled a task force to create a process for exploring this type of institutional change request. The process includes this series of public events so that we can learn about the history of the namesake, the decision to name the college after him, and how his legacy is affecting the community we serve. We've been guided by our commitment to the mission of the college, to research-based decision-making where diverse perspectives are considered and to engaging campus st stakeholders and the larger community in respectful dialogue. Ultimately, what we learn together through these events coupled with community feedback will help us formulate 
our recommendation regarding the request to change the name of the college. Please note that the purpose of this series is to inform the creation of that recommendation on the name change. We are not yet considering other name, naming alternatives. So we invite you to join us in learning more and encourage your comments and questions to all of our events via online surveys, which um, Matt described, and you'll hear more about at the end of the program. So I now want to turn it back to Dr. Matt Wettstein, the President Superintendent of Cabrillo College, who will uh, introduce tonight's speakers. Well, thank you again, Christina, for your leadership and to you and Adam Spickler, one of the other board members who serves on that committee. Um, we really appreciate this. And I also want to extend thanks to Victoria Banyalas, who has been so instrumental in helping to uh, invite speakers for tonight's panel and also has been serving on our advisory task force. So thank you, Victoria, as well. Um, before we begin tonight, I just wanna cover a couple of ground rules, lay out the structure for the lecture and, and presentations. Uh, we have the pre and post survey, so you'll see me posting and chat occasionally to invite you to participate that way. Uh, we also are going to have the ability to do Q and A uh, so using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, you can type in a question. And Kristen Fabos, who's our um, Director of Marketing and Communications, and I will help to curate the question and answer session as we get towards the end of tonight's session. All of the panelists who are presenting their information tonight, uh, please keep in mind that we seek to bring important historical perspectives to you, to the discussion of the college's name. Uh, and you and, I, you and I may may find that we agree with a lot of what they say, um, and we may also disagree, but all of us, I, I would say, would benefit from learning various new viewpoints about history, and particularly the history of our region and California. So that's our hope, to expand people's minds tonight and increase knowledge about the history of our region. So we have several great distinguished speakers here with us tonight. I wanna to do introductions of them and then we'll turn it over to them. First is Canyon Sayers Roots, who is the CEO of Canyon Root, excuse me, Canyon Consulting. And she is, excuse me, I gotta find my notes here and capture where I was. Uh, Canyon is a member of the um, uh, Mutsun Ohlone Chumash tribes and is, um, goes by her given name of Coyote Woman. She's proud of her heritage and her native name and is very active in the native community. She is an artist, poet, a published author, activist, student, and teacher. Her art has been featured at the De Young Museum, uh, the Silmarts Gallery, Gathering Tribes, uh, in Snag Magazine, and numerous powwows and indigenous gatherings. She's a recent graduate of the Art Institute of California, obtaining her associate and her bachelor of science degrees in web design and interactive media. Canyon's the daughter of a well-known Ohlone native elder, Anne Marie Sayers, who is featured in the recent documentary, In the Land of My Ancestors. Uh, Canyon's gonna provide a land acknowledgement statement and some other comments um, before we launch into our other two panelists who I want to introduce as well. Dr. Kutcha Rissling Baldi is an assistant professor and department chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University. Uh, her research is focused on indigenous feminisms, Californian Indians, and decolonization. Her book, titled We Are Dancing for You Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies, is available through all major booksellers. She received her PhD in Native American Studies with a designated emphasis in feminist theory and research from UC Davis. And she also has an MFA in creative writing and literary research from San Diego State University and a bachelor's in psychology from Stanford University. Dr. Rissling Baldi is a Hoopa Yurok at Kauruk and an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northern California. Uh, and in 2007, Dr. Rissling Baldi co-founded the Native Women's Collective, a nonprofit organization that supports the continued revitalization of Native American arts and culture. She lives up in hum Humboldt County with her husband, her daughter, uh, and a puppy named Buffy, I understand. 
Uh, and then our third speaker tonight is Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez, who I'm proud to say is a former Cabrillo College student uh, who received his PhD from the history department at UC Santa Cruz in 2016. And he's currently the California State Park historian of the Santa Cruz district. His research and writings explore the history of indigenous uh, people of the Santa Cruz area. And he worked closely, works closely and collaboratively with the Ama Mutsen and other mission surviving families. He's published multiple articles on this topic and his first book about local indigenous history is scheduled for publication later this year with University of Nebraska Press titled, We Are Not Animals, Indigenous Politics of Resistance, Rebellion, and Reconstitution in 19th Century California. Among other projects, he's currently directing and producing a full length documentary film called Walk for the Ancestors. It's a story, a film that tells the story of Caroline Ward and her son Kagan, members of the Los Angeles based Tataviam tribe, who in 2015 walked from mission to mission across California to honor their ancestors and protest the canonization of Juniper Cerro. Dr. Rizzo Martinez has taught history courses at UC Santa Cruz, at Cabrillo College, uh, and also to high security inmates at Salinas Valley State Prison. So without any further ado, it was a real pleasure for me to introduce Canyon Sayers Ruins to open up the discussion and our presentations tonight. Go ahead, Canyon. Mishmin Tuhis, thank you so very much for that amazing introduction. I am honored to share space with these amazing beings. I am so happy to be here. Hopefully my background noise is not too impeding. I apologize if it is. <clears throat> Mishmin Tulhis, Connor Cod Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sarah's Roots. <laughs> I come from Indian Canyon Nation, the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara along central coastal California. That being said, being the daughter of a tribal chairwoman, I recognize my privilege. Being raised on the land of my ancestors, where my grandmothers, grandmothers, grandmothers have always been from, and to be raised where culture sharing is a day-to-day -day activity and interaction that I was able to be raised in and honor. Indigenous protocol, or today we sometimes call it land acknowledgements, is a way that we might be able to acknowledge the land that we are on in today's post-colonial settler environment. Indigenous protocol is a way that we can acknowledge truth in history about the original stewards of the land that we are on and that we benefit from. And so having been raised on the land of my ancestors, my mother, my grandmother, being of a matrilineal society, we have always believed that when song, ceremony, and dancing stops, so does the earth. I very much believe that. And so I want to offer a grandmother song. This grandmother song came to me differently than it was taught. I identify as a Mutsun Ohlone and Chumash activist, artist, and consultant. And this is a grandmother song that came to me differently than my mentor taught. Because whenever I sing that grandmother song with my mentor, that it is only meant to be sung with that person and in those spaces. This song came to me differently than it was taught, and therefore it is able to be shared intertribally, intercommunally, and to the community. It is to honor our grandmothers, their grandmothers, and in all Mother Earth, for without them and without her, we would not be here. We share this time and space together for a reason. So it's with that humility, that gratitude, that present-mindedness that I offer this song here to this space. And I will use my regalia as an instrument because indigenous peoples don't wear costumes. This is my medicine. So this is Canyon's Chumash Grandmother song. My, my, oh, come on. My, my, oh, come My, my, no, oh, my, my, oh, come My, my, oh, no, Oh, no. 
you to say, oh. <clears throat> in my community, if we were in a circle, I'd have you all saying, oh, really, really strong, because that helps us. That helps us send yeah. those prayers out in a good way. That helps us acknowledge that we are in community together. It helps us be united. So I find it so very important that we honor truth in history, that we take the time to consider how we came to be here together. Why are things the way they are? Part of that is just acknowledging indigenous protocol by becoming familiar with the indigenous peoples and the histories of these spaces and places. Because when I honestly believe that when we honor indigenous pedagogies and acknowledging indigenous protocol, when we honor the past to shape the future, we can strategize sustainable futures. And that means we need to look at history thoroughly. We cannot bypass, we cannot sweep it under the rug. We need to bring everything to light and then consider it. Honor the past to shape the future is not just highlighting the beautiful, wonderful sparks of occurrences, it's integrally listening and understanding how we got to where we got to. Because in all honesty, did you know that 10 years before I was brought to this earth, before I was born, 1978 was the first time the indigenous people in the Americas had the right to practice their religion freely. The 1978 Indian Freedom of Religion Act. 10 years. I have a feeling that a good portion of our audience was born before then. You were born before indigenous people had the right to practice their religion freely. And it's like, I have to share this because just because I'm an indigenous person doesn't mean like I got a zap of knowledge that all of a sudden just informed me of all of these truths, these truths and atrocious crimes against indigenous peoples and against humanity and for that matter. And I have to share this. And I, my indigenous name, my native name is Coyote Woman. And I will be that rambunctious, wily coyote offering the conversations of the in-between. That's what inspired me to start my business because many organizations and government agencies don't like to talk to individuals. So how do tribes and communities get their perspective shared? We have to play their game. So I started Canyon Consulting LLC to bridge the gap between indigenous and contemporary value systems. At the same time, I'm anti-capitalist. I'm, I'm flipping everything, everything I encounter. And so my coyote nature will put me in these positions. So. I understand there might be things that will be said here that some people may feel uncomfortable with. Feel it, listen to it. We need to have these uncomfortable conversations because in all honesty, I am not okay with that introduction that I heard about the name change, that publicized piece of media. All of my relatives who tried to watch it could not consume that media either. So there has to be said, there, that has to be said at this moment in time. If we want to honor truth in history, listen to the community, hear us, and it's gonna be uncomfortable and we're not gonna get it right the first or second time, but part of it is hearing us, being compassionate and recognizing that we all don't know what we don't know and there's a lot that we can learn, but when we come together and when we honor truth in history, we could take steps to honoring all of our ancestors. Because when you think about it, when we honor our ancestors and their ancestors, all of us have ancestors that are indigenous to the land that they come from. Meaning we could all honor our indigeneity. And part of that is acknowledging indigenous protocol. If you are not on the homeland of your ancestors, you should consider how you are being a good guest and how you are honoring truth and history with where it is that you stand. So please hear these amazing beings. I am so humbled and honored to be in this space. I am happy to <laughs> offer an acknowledgement. And I encourage you, check out nativeland.ca because you can say every meeting you go to from here on out, you can say, I'm calling in. Right now, I will let you know where I'm at. I'm in Gilroy. <laughs> I am calling in from Mutsun Ohlone territory. And even when I visit far away, I will always say where I'm at whenever I'm part of these meetings. And I encourage you to do so too. Every Zoom meeting that you are a part of, 
you could say, right now I'm calling in from occupied this territory. And you can find out where you're at too by going to native-land.ca. And so honoring truth and history, all of us can take steps. So I wanna say thank you to everyone. I'm honored to be here. And we're gonna hear some amazing elements of perspective, conversation, and yeah, it might be a little uncomfortable, but we gotta hear it. And I'm honored to share space with these amazing, bad, beautiful beings. So welcome everyone. Welcome to Occupied Ohlone Territory. Honor, truth, and history. Thank you very much, Kenny. And our next speaker is Dr. Kocha Risling Baldi. Thank you so much. And I'm very, very um, humbled and honored by the opening and the space allowed to have an opening that I think really truly um, respects Native protocols and how we introduce ourselves, how we get to know each other and build relationship. Um, I, I'll start with my introduction for you all. Um, I'm Dr. Kutcher Risling Baldi. I'm Hoopa York and Karuk and enrolled in the Hoopa Valley tribe. And I just noticed earlier that my mom and dad are actually logged in on here. So uh, my mom and dad are here listening right now. My dad is Steve Baldi and my mom is Lois Risling. And if you ever, if after this speech, you're like, I wonder where she learned all that. Well, they're here. They're right here listening. And um, I was actually talking to my mom about this talk last night on the phone and some of the things that I had planned to say. So I'm glad that she's here with us today. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about something that I wrote and I spent uh, today kind of revising it and, and working through it and kind of thinking about what parts of myself I wanted to share in a space like this. I consistently realize we're not building the same types of relationships right now uh, via Zoom. But just know that um, I, I think about these things very clearly in terms of, uh, I kind of wanted to approach this in two directions and I'm gonna try to do this in my short 20 minutes, right? Um, the first is to talk a little bit about uh, Cabrillo, right? Like Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. And I, I don't think that for me, when I was thinking about like how I wanted to approach this, I don't think that this is a moment to actually investigate or even put on trial Cabrillo the man. Uh, I choose not to center Cabrillo in this endeavor because who is Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo? Um, I mean, really, do we wake up in the morning and think something like, well, thank goodness Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo discovered this bay because who knows what I'd be doing, what I'd be making my coffee if Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo hadn't done what he had done, right? I don't think we actually think about him on a fairly regular basis. Um, I don't even think we really know that guy very well. So I actually don't know if that's what the point of a discussion like this is. Uh, we can lay out like facts and archival documents about who he is, but in the end, it really doesn't matter who Cabrillo is because we're not talking about Cabrillo the man, we're talking about Cabrillo the name, the representation, uh, the colonization that happens through naming and the importance of renaming. This is not actually about Cabrillo. It's about what it means to name something, to, uh, to honor the places where we work and research and teach and dream and hopefully build future generations that are far more able to center a world that values justice and climate resiliency and a history that doesn't disempower the voices of our most marginalized peoples. We know that naming is important it's the reason why uh, we don't just go willy nilly around renaming things all the time. You know that moment where native people are like, hey, change the name. And then someone's always like, it's just a name. Uh, my response to that is like, you're right. It's just a name, so change it. Uh, we know naming is important and that it means something, that there is a value to how we name things and who we center and who is represented which is why we get uncomfortable when people start talking about renaming. What would it mean though to wake up and have markers and monuments and buildings and roads that are named for the most marginalized among us? What if we were surrounded by indigenous languages and indigenous place names and indigenous faces? In my region, we have a sacred island for the Wiat peoples. For many years, it became known as Indian Island. This was because a group of Humboldt County citizens came one night and tried to massacre 
all the Wiat women and children and elders who were sleeping there. Last year, the city of Eureka returned the island to the Wiat. This is their sacred center of the world. And after 150 years, it came back. And now we make an effort to call it Tuluat, not Indian Island, not Gunther's Island, which is what it was named after this guy Gunther tried to steal it from the Wiat who were forced to run away, but Tuluat, a place of world renewal for everyone. I don't really care about Cabrillo the man because he was just a man. It was we who elevated his status when we put a bunch of monuments up and we're like, yeah, Cabrillo. Uh, I actually think of this tweet I saw one time where someone was like, all these people say constantly, don't worry, history will judge whoever it is that we're supposed to be judging eventually who did something bad. And yet we don't even judge the colonizing genocidal slaveholders who sex traffic native girls, mostly children, and then participated in this system the mission system that then starved native people and forced them to build missions while whipping them with various objects. We still say things like, isn't he just a man of his time? I hate the man of his time argument, by the way, because it's very shallow. Every man in every time had many other men and women and gender non-conforming people who thought that that guy was a jerk and were horrified by what was happening at that time. Name me a time and I can find you at least one person who was saying, somebody stop this, this is bad. You know who always knew that there was a problem at that time? Native people. We always had the opinion of that time that that guy was not a good guy of the time. For Cabrillo, if you need not native people to tell you he wasn't a cool dude, you can point to people like Bartolome de las Casas, who wrote things like, quote, with my own eyes, I saw Spaniards cut off the nose and ears of Indians, male and female, without provocation, merely because it pleased them to do it. Likewise, I saw how they summoned the chief rulers to come, assuring them safety, and when they peacefully came, they were taken captive and burned. Or even another quote, they took infants from their mother's breasts, snatching them by the legs and pitching them headfirst against the crags or snatched them by the arms and threw them into the rivers, roaring with laughter and saying as the babies fell into the water, boil there, you offspring of the devil. Cabrillo was known at a point for joining forces with Hernan Cortez in Mexico and enslaving native people, putting men to work in the mines for gold and forcing them to build his ships and then sending the women and girls to his soldiers for sex slavery. He invaded cities throughout Central America, then made his expeditions up into what is currently called California and one day fell out of his boat, cut open his shin because a group of Tongva people were attacking his soldiers and then died of gangrene. Uh, I'm gonna consider that a victory for the Tonga. He was basically just a rich dude in his time who sailed some places. None of his place names actually stuck because people of his time didn't really pay attention to what he was doing. It wasn't until 1913 when President Woodrow Wilson proclamated the construction of a quote, heroic statue of Cabrillo. By 1926, the order became defunct because nobody did anything about it. And President Calvin Coolidge was like, somebody build a monument. And he told the native sons of the Golden West to do it, but then they didn't do it either because they couldn't get their act together. So finally in 1939, the Portuguese government commissioned a statue and donated it to the United States. And then we got the Cabrillo National Monument. And then Cabrillo College was founded in 1959. Now I digress because I don't wanna get lost in reinterpreting these Western archives to discuss Cabrillo the man or Cabrillo the historical figure. These archives were written to silence native people by documenting really our death and our enslavement with words like labor and punishment. I don't wanna get into the weeds about if we were meant to parse words over things like rape, when one of the very first things that Father Junipero Serra documented in his writings was the rape of women and children by Spanish soldiers. It's unfortunate that not enough people know about what happened with Spanish conquest or what colonization truly means. We honor the colonizers, not because they deserve it, 
People of their time didn't even think they deserved it. Columbus, for instance, was like kind of a joke to people of his time. That guy thought he was in India. They knew he was the joke. So we honor the colonizers today because we are meant to internalize these logics of settler colonialism to justify the ongoing dispossession of land, life, history, and sovereignty of indigenous peoples. The name is meant to disregard the historical fact that violence and genocide is what it took to build the state of California. We have to learn to justify logics like manifest destiny and heteropatriarchy and terra nullius and the doctrine of discovery. I often tell my students that this idea, this discovery idea, um, that somehow it's important or possible to like discover a place where millions of people already live and that somehow discovery is binding and legal and real. We have to learn that because it's the basis for most of our federal law. We have enshrined in our legal system that if you are a Christian colonizing nation, you can discover a non-Christian nation and claim it as your own. We inherited this from the British, which we should all find hilarious because we are taught as young American citizens that we reject everything British and the British way of doing things. We wrote a mean letter to the king and we were like, we declare independence and we will never be like you ever, except we claim to be the discovering nation of native peoples in this region, even though we aren't at all, because it would have actually been the British or the Spanish. So basically we have no discovery street cred, but we embrace it like we do. That's what naming's about. The naming from American presidents honoring discoverers of this continent is about ongoing dispossession. They came here and they tried to rename our lands, to remove our memory from this place and to end us. They started with renaming. It was clear to them that they had to name it to claim it. We had already named everything. Kat Anderson points out in her book, Tending the Wild, that in California, there was no wilderness because every place already had a name. California Indians had named every place. They asked us, what's this place? And we told them, this is the land that made us. This is the water that nourishes us. We call it relative. And they stripped it and mined it and destroyed it and spilled our blood upon it and then erased us from the texts, the songs, the street names, the map markers, the monuments that were erected to pretend like this history was justified. We can name a university after anybody or anything that we want. Why do we want to honor colonization, dispossession and genocide? Whether or not Cabrillo was a kind of okay dude, the naming of a university after him is not to honor him as a person, but instead it is to honor him and name a university after a Spanish colonizer who was, and what he did to support ongoing colonization and dispossession. Okay, second. Sometimes when I'm in the archives, I will read a short line or scribble made by some white guy discoverer. Um, who with flippancy and shallowness will write about the Indians or, or Los Indígenas. Columbus wrote in his writings about a woman he raped once and how she scratched at him and fought him off. So he had to tie her up with a rope so tightly that she cried, quote, unheard of cries. That's what he said. He wrote about her unheard of. And then he added, quote, it seemed she had studied at a school for whores. This Indian woman who fought him off, who cried out, this Indian woman who Columbus said he amused himself with. Junipero Serra wrote in 1778, quote, the soldiers clever as they were at lassoing cows and mules would catch an Indian woman with their lassos to become prey for their unbridled lust. At times, some Indian men would try to defend their wives only to be shot down with bullets. And he ended with, quote, even the children who came to the mission were not safe from their baseness. I read these things. I live these words in my body. And then I think about my daughter. I think about what I would have done 
if they tried to rip her, rip her from my arms and take her from me, what I would have done if I heard those cries and how we would have cried for her. See, cause we're people, we're human beings. And I cannot pretend like those cries don't travel through time in an archive full of words that were meant to discuss us and dismiss us like we were less than human and a history that's written even now by people who would say these were men of their time or they were just doing what they were told or they were just soldiers. What it means that we held each other at night and prayed for the future, that we breathed in the scent of our babies and our young ones and wondered how we would survive. I remind myself, like I'm reminding you here, that we are and have always been human beings, that we likely begged for the lives of our children, that we loved each other and hoped and ran and fought and cried and sang and danced. And even with all of that, we are still here. I sometimes don't know if I would have been able to survive it. But I know that there were those of us that did, who carried forward stories and songs and jokes and visions and prayers and knowledges. And that's what I wanna honor. Not the story of a colonizing regime, not monuments to attempted conquering of us, not fantasy stories about discovery, but the love that survived and carried us forward. This place had a name before Cabrillo. That name was built with us. It was called out and it has survived. And why wouldn't we want to honor that name? The name of this place that for so long before was filled with love and laughter and hope for the future. The name of this place that knows a time before this colonization and that helps us to envision what this future will be like long after this colonization is done. So I want to end here. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen really quick. Um, in case you don't know her, this is Toy Perina, a Tongva medicine woman who led a revolt against the mission San Gabriel uh, on October 25th, 1785. Uh, as a result of her revolt, she was exiled to the mission Carmel and she died in Mission San Juan Bautista at age 39. The revolt was very important. It was an example of Indian people uh, pushing back against a system that was trying to destroy them. It demonstrates that as they were working through this change in their world, they resisted, they fought, and they did it even if they thought it meant that it felt impossible because I think they needed to make sure that we had some of these stories to tell. Now, a lot of people don't know about Toy Perina, which I think is really unfortunate to know that she's a medicine person who led a revolt. But those of us who know, those indigenous peoples that carry on this story, we never let her be forgotten. And we demonstrate for people how important it is that her voice is carried forward. I think about this when I think about our young people, about how they go into a school system that devalues their histories. They are surrounded by monuments and names of places that devalue their histories. And we push back with our own monuments, our own murals, our own renaming. And we remind our young people that they should be empowered by history, not feel dejected and sidelined which is what history does right now. Now, in 2015, they declared Junipero Serra, the father of the Spanish mission system, a saint. And as California Indians tried to reconcile what this would mean, that somehow a man that was responsible for the attempted genocide of so many indigenous peoples, the enslavement, the destruction of land, and of course, the removal of native peoples from their regions, that somehow he would be a saint. What was really important is that at this time, as Sarah was declared saint, somebody, and I don't know who, went around and started to post 
street signs over any sign that was named Sarah Way, Sarah Street, Sarah Avenue, and replaced it with Toy Perina. To be able to see that, to be able to feel that, what it meant that our people were being named as the true people that we should be honoring, the people that we should know about. And I wanna leave you with that as a vision of what we can do and why that's so important. Now in Hoopa, what we say at the end of a story is Hayanantik. That means like, it's done, that's it, it's over. But what it also means is it reaches so far. I ask that you take the things that you heard today and take them to the next place. Uh, let it reach as far as it can possibly go and think about how it affects you as you move forward in this world. So we'll end by saying set dia. Uh, that means thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Kocha Rissling Baldi. Um, wonderful presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez. And I, I believe, Martin, you have the ability to share your screen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, it truly is an honor to be here and uh, especially to share the floor with uh, two of my heroes, uh, both Kenny and Kutcher are, are just phenomenal uh, people. So uh, that was very powerful. Uh, I will, before I share the screen, or actually as I share the screen and figure out, navigate the technology here, uh, I, I would like to say a couple of things really quickly uh, about Toy Perina. I think um, it's really amazing that uh, she was brought up in that story. I think uh, people don't realize, but uh, she actually had three children um, who she died when they were very young. Um, but they grew up in Santa Cruz. They lived at the Via de Branson Forte. Uh, and there's, uh, anyway, very fascinating stories of uh, the, her daughters in particular. Her son died when he was young. Um, but, uh, and I believe that there are descendants today of Toy Perina uh, and of those, the two daughters there. Uh, so anyway, just thought I would mention that. Um, so I also, um, well, first of all, I, I want to follow what Kenny was uh, suggesting as well and, and point out that I'm talking to you all uh, from the city of Soquel, uh, which is on Waipi lands and the Awaswa speaking Ohlone, Ohlone tribe, the Waipi, uh, who are the ancestral relatives to today's uh, Mutsun people. That includes the Ama Mutsun and other uh, Mutsun families like that of Canyons. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that as well. Uh, but I also uh, do not plan on uh, talking uh, about Cabrillo uh, other than to say that, uh, you know, Cabrillo was somebody who passed by this area uh, in a boat once. He didn't even stop uh, and get off the boat. Um, and so that's the extent of uh, what I'd like to talk about Cabrillo. Uh, but instead, I would like to talk to you all about uh, local indigenous history, uh, about names, about erasure. Um, this here, this map that I'm showing you here is a map that was originally uh, uh, produced by uh, Ed Ketchum, who's the Amundsen tribal historian. Uh, I worked with him on this and uh, made some adjustments to some of the areas in the Waswas uh, uh, area, which is uh, this area that we're here in Santa Cruz. Um, but I want to uh, start with this because I want to give you a sense of things. And I want to point out that, uh, you know, that everything already had names. Uh, this is kind of building on the previous talk, which really uh, was saying a lot of this uh, similar things. But, uh, you know, all of these lands here, all of the mountains, all the rivers, all of these villages, all the people uh, had longstanding names uh, for many, many years, thousands of years before this process of colonialism. Uh, but the process of colonialism is a process of renaming. It's a process of imposing names uh, it's, uh, and also erasing names by this process as well and erasing histories. Um, uh, I want to point out a couple things here. Uh, the mountain ranges that we know of today as the Santa Cruz Mountain Range uh, were known by the people as the Maxa Reja uh, here. Uh, and then the mountain range that's known as the Diablo Range uh, is over here, was known as the uh, Sha Choka. Um, and I, I, I want to draw attention to the Diablo Range in particular. I think that you'll notice throughout the state of California, there are many things that are named Diablo, including in the Bay Area, uh, a Mount Diablo, which is a very high mountain that's a very central point. Um, well, the, uh, there's an excellent article written by Bev Ortiz about this, but uh, the history of the Diablo Mountain, for example, uh, obviously was not called that. The Chechenyo people called it uh, Tuishtak. Uh, the Oyom Pele, uh, it was called Oyom Pele by the Sierra Miwok. Uh, this is a mountain that uh, tribes from all different areas would come. Their spiritual leaders would come to this, men and women, they would gather to have ceremony. 
Um, part of the reason when you see things that are named Diablo, uh, usually uh, the reason for this is because the Spanish would uh, label places where spiritual leaders went to uh, as being of the devil, right? And so these names stick, it becomes the Diablo, and it's, uh, you know, usually that's a good indication that it is a place of spiritual significance uh, for the people in the tribes that were here before the Spanish. Um, and this particular place is one of the places where uh, the people practice the Kuxui uh, ceremony, which is a very important ceremony, a very important deity. Uh, and in the Spanish records, they talk about uh, seeing the, you know, being afraid of the Kuxui, who they leveled as the devil, as a Diablo. So uh, these types of names are there uh, for a reason, right? And if we trace them back, you can understand this process of colonialism. Uh, I do want to point out, uh, for those who don't know, you might notice a, a familiar name here, Aptos. Uh, you know, those who live in this area or attended Cabrillo College, you know that it's in a town that is called Aptos. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that Aptos was actually the name of the people of this area. Uh, people don't really recognize it today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Aptos and give you a little bit of history about them in particular. Um, but before I do that, uh, I want to talk about uh, some other local names uh, and kind of go over uh, introduce uh, a couple of these things. In the local languages, uh, there's different uh, Ohlone dialects. Um, the Mutsun and the Waswas were the closest ones, the Rumsun to the south. Um, but in all the local dialects, uh, this suffix here of ta or tak, uh, or sometimes rook, it means a place of or the home of. Uh, and so some of these names uh, are things that are out there in the records, uh, but we don't use them today. Uh, Santa Cruz was known as Alintak. Uh, which was, translates uh, here, as you see, to the place of the Rab Ab Red Abalone. Alintak was a village uh, that was in kind of near downtown Santa Cruz, near like where the boardwalk is today, in that hill right there. Uh, it was part of this village center. Um, another place, uh, Watsonville, was called uh, Tiuvtak, which means place of the elk. Now, some people might have heard the story of Portola, the Portola expedition. When Portola came through, uh, he, uh, their infamous expedition, 1769, they passed through, they, they in, 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 uh, ran into people at this village of Tiufta, uh, and this is where uh, the village had left, they were in the middle of a condor ceremony, which is uh, sending messages to the dead, uh, as condor does, and they had erected a stuffed bird there, and this bird, uh, of course, is the reason that we call it Pajaro Valley, right, the Spanish called it, uh, they recognized this bird, this giant bird, uh, and they, they decided to call, we still call it Pajaro Valley from that. Uh, of course, the place is actually called Tiuftak, uh, and in those, if you read the expedition notes, they actually ran into a bunch of elk uh, right in the area. But of course, they didn't recognize that this was the place of the elk, partly because even though they were both, both the Spanish and the indigenous peoples here were inhabiting the same physical space, they were in two different worlds, right? And this is that colonial uh, difference, right? This colonial imposition of a Spanish world that they're bringing with them and ignoring and erasing the indigenous world, which is very much there and alive. Um, underneath this. So um, moving on, a couple of other names. Hollister was known as Kotretak, uh, which is a place of the gopher snake. Uh, Fremont Peak, I'm going to mention Fremont a little bit later. Fremont, uh, just briefly, was uh, an American general who was known for massacring uh, women and children. Uh, we celebrate him. We call it City of Fremont. Um, the peak over, overlooks uh, where Cabrillo College is. If you go inland, it's right, the highest mountain peak back there. Uh, it's called Fremont Peak, but it had a name. It was called Toy. Toyotak, uh, which is the place of the bumblebees. Uh, the Monterey Bay itself had a name, which is Kalandaruk, um, which means ocean homes, right? Um, so, uh, and then Santa Cruz, bringing it back or to Cabrillo, uh, in the town of Aptos was a village called Kayastaka. Um, we don't exactly know the translation on it. Um, my, my guess on it, I could be wrong on this, is uh, these ones are more established for the oral histories. Um, but it does seem to correspond to a word for jackrabbit. It's possible that that means a place of jackrabbit. Um, okay, uh, I want to move on from this. I want to show you another map. I'm going to show you a couple maps here. So I hope, uh, hope that you all uh, appreciate the maps that I'm showing. Uh, this is a map that uh, was built on the work of uh, Randall Milliken, um, but I worked closely with Ed Ketchum, again, the Amundsen travel historian, um, to kind of uh, integrate some of uh, more, uh, you know, broader thinkings of territories and stuff to build this map. Um, but I also want to point out, um, you know, give you a sense of this. Right here, where we are, of course, is in Aptos uh, territory, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, and again, I want to point out that it's important to see these maps because this process, you know, we live in California where 
everywhere around us are these Spanish names, right? Santa Cruz, um, all, all up and down the states. Um, but of course, these names, everything already had names, right? These, these indigenous names already existed. They're already, uh, you know, here. Um, they're just uh, been, they've been hidden, right, through this process of colonialism. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Aptos people uh, and what time we have here to, uh, to introduce. I think uh, a lot of people don't really know much about the Aptos people, um, but they were a large tribe in this area. Um, there was, as I mentioned before, one of the large villages was called Cayastaca. Uh, there's two main groups of them. Um, there's about 183 people, Aptos people who are baptized in Mission Santa Cruz. And like I said, with the imposition of names onto places, uh, the same thing happened with tribes. The Aptos tribe, the, the missionaries uh, renamed them. They started calling them the San Lucas. Uh, they started calling people by different tribes and villages uh, according to saints' names. Uh, the Cayastaca villagers, they call San Antonio. The Uipi tribe that lived just uh, north in the Santa Cruz area, they call San Daniel. Uh, the same process of, of imposing of, uh, you know, imposing a Spanish uh, values, of course, this is uh, Catholic Franciscan ideas, right, so they're imposing these saints names uh, onto people. Um, this is this is how it was. Uh, the Aptos people had uh, in the oral histories, they talk about uh, a little bit of a conflict between uh, the, the chief of the Aptos, which is a fellow named Molenius. Uh, actually, I write here the head family, and I, I want to point out real quick that they, they always recognize the male chiefs. We know the indigenous peoples around here uh, also had female leaders as well. And so uh, we have to take this with a grain of salt sometimes when we look at this and understand that uh, it may very well have been that the, uh, the wife was actually the leader, right? But the Spanish, with their patriarchal lens, they didn't see this, right? They were, they were again, invisible. They erased this uh, matrilineal uh, you know, pattern within uh, native people or custom, right? Um, so they renamed, again, when they would baptize people, they would give them Spanish names. Uh, and so they, they renamed um, Milenius as Balthazar and Salou, his wife, as Anna. Uh, and like I said, there was a, a little bit of a conflict between uh, the Aptos and the Uipi people. Um, and the leader of the Uipi was a fellow named Sokel. And again, I point this out because this is another name that many people in Santa Cruz area know Sokel. It's the big boulevard that runs through here. It's a town where I'm living. Um, you know, these, uh, these names do are here, but people don't recognize this. So Kel was uh, the leader of the OEP people along with his wife, Ross Wem. Um, and they were, when the Spanish arrived here and they built the mission, they actually gave So Kel uh, a couple of cattle and a couple of birds in exchange for founding the mission on his territory. Um, and this is another pattern of colonialism where the Spanish would select certain leaders that they privileged that they wanted to work with and they would exacerbate existing tensions, right? And they would uh, draw these tensions between different peoples by giving uh, certain things. This is a very old colonial process that goes back uh, to early Spanish colonialism. Um, another quick thing, uh, I don't have enough time to get into everything about the Aptos people, but uh, like so many things in the mission, uh, the conditions were so miserable, and I'm going to talk about that more in depth shortly here. Um, but in 1804, a measles epidemic came through, and the conditions of the missions were uh, so ripe for diseases and death um, because of these really poor conditions that about a quarter of the Aptos people who were living in the mission uh, in 1804 died uh, at that time. Um, let's see. Uh, here's another map for you. Uh, this is one that I've been working on. Um, uh, right now in a project in collaboration with Canyon uh, and with the uh, we're trying to develop a new plaque for uh, Mission Plaza. And there's a map we've been working on uh, uh, to show what you see here is these are the tribes that eventually ended up at Mission Santa Cruz. And um, I, I let me go back on that word. I, when I say ended up here, let me be more transparent about this. The process of missionization was, uh, this is something that scholars debate uh, you know, in the very early years, there is an element of people coming to the missions to find out what's going there. But very quickly, this turned into a, a militaristic uh, situation. And certainly by the time uh, you can see here, Mission Santa Cruz is right here in Oipi territories. Um, very quickly, the, the different peoples here end up to being about 35 different tribal, uh, tribal or villages who end up uh, at Mission Santa Cruz, all the way reaching into San Joaquin Valley here, into Yokut's territory, into Mutsun territory over here. Process. Uh, was a militaristic one, right? Uh, there are letters uh, from the Padres who talk about celebrating, uh, oh, you know, we wiped out a whole village. We brought every last one, even the crippled people um, back with us. What a joy, all these souls are saved, right? Uh, we left some dead. Uh, these, you know, they're, it's very transparent. It's in the archives. It's right there for everyone to see that this process uh, was a very destructive process. Um, 
let me talk a little bit more about this. Uh, I want to focus. Um, I when I uh, had some friends who uh, the Tatavian family that was mentioned earlier who travel from mission to mission in 2015 in protest of Sarah, and they asked me to uh, do a little research and to look into uh, the number of baptisms and burials at each mission site as they went from mission to mission. Um, and so I, I compiled this chart out of that as I went through each of these. Um, I want to give you a sense of this. What you're seeing on the, uh, the highlighted areas of Santa Cruz and San Batista, uh, and this is in relation to the missions, um, what you're seeing on the far right is the is the death rates, right? So you're seeing um, the percentage of people, native people who are baptized at the mission and the percentage of native burials that are at the mission. And this is a very brief period of time. We're talking about uh, Santa Cruz is founded in 1791. We're talking to, uh, about 1835, so about a 45 year period. Um, and what you see at Santa Cruz is there was about a, over a 90% death rate. And, it, and I will acknowledge too that some of these numbers don't capture uh, so to speak, the the fugitives. There were fugitives, people who would leave the missions that we don't have records of, right? So these numbers are are likely a little bit low uh, as well, right? The numbers are, of people who are actually dying of impact from this uh, were higher on this. Mission San Batista was over 85% of the people who went there died. Um, there is a debate in academia um, about what is the nature of the missions, right? People debate whether the missions were, uh, we can look at them as um, concentration camps, or whether they should be seen as just work camps, or whether they should be seen as prisons, um, all of the, this, this, you know, academic debate about this. Um, well, I want to point this out. I think it's important to look at these numbers and the impact of things, because while it is true, and I believe the other speaker talked a little bit, I'm uh, talking about a couple of weeks ago, about how the Spanish, uh, the purpose of the, the Spanish colonization was to make Native people their laborers, their workforce, their slaves, pretty much, right, is the comparable uh, analysis here. But uh, and while that is true, right, it wasn't their incentive to kill people. When you look at these numbers, right, when you see 90, over 90% of the people are dying uh, at the mission, what you see is that there was no effort put into protecting and to helping people, right? The, and when the conditions end up being the same, right, when we look at like the numbers from Auschwitz, right, uh, some of the worst concentration camps, the number is about 85%. Of the people who went into these camps died. So, in effect, the end result, whatever the the aims or the goals of the missionaries might have been, um, the end result is that people are dying on a number that we. The only other comparable thing we can think of is some of the worst concentration camps in Nazi Germany. So, it, you know, it, this this debate is an academic one, right? For the families who survived the missions, for the people who whose ancestors actually survived this? I mean, do you think that they care whether, you know, what kind of model you can map this up to? The trauma is, is there, right? I mean, this is this is a traumatic experience of devastating loss, uh, incredible loss for, for all of the tribes, all of the peoples who went through here. Um, the people survive, who did survive, right? The families, the ancestors of, of like our, our previous speakers here today, uh, you know, these, these ancestors, they survived because of their ingenuity, because of their, um, their fortitude because of their resilience, because they endured and were able to uh, push past in, in spite of uh, the situation given to them by the missionaries uh, and later by the Americans we'll talk about too. Um, okay, I want to give you one more map too, uh, or one more chart. So this is, I did an analysis looking at Mission Santa Cruz of, um, of children, right? There's 473 children who are born at Mission Santa Cruz. Uh, this is the infant mortality. This is a little devastating, uh, but if you look at this, when I actually went through and looked at what happened to this, I was trying to see how long did they survive? Did the children survive in the missions? Uh, what you see on the far left here, uh, over 50%, 52.6% of the people who went, in, who were born at Mission Santa Cruz did not survive to the age of one, to one year old, right? Um, they died you know, either at birth or right afterwards. That's over half of the children born there. Um, and then the next, uh, the next marker, right, I took it up to age five, right, so between age one and five, over a quarter, 27.7%. You put this together, right, you have almost 80% of the people born at the mission did not survive to the age of five. I mean, it's, it's unthinkable to imagine what it would be like to be in a situation like this, right? Um, less than 15% of the people born at the mission survived past the age of 15 to adulthood. Uh, many others died in their teenage, 15, 17, 18, um, but I didn't, I didn't take it that far because I think it's devastating enough to just see what these numbers are like here. Um, I talked about this more in an article I did last year. If people want it, I can send that to them. 
Um, okay. Uh, I want to talk about Mission Santa Cruz. You know, uh, the Amamutsun uh, people who have family who descend from Mission Santa Cruz, they um, they talk about in their families how Santa Cruz, Mission Santa Cruz is known as being one of the most, uh, the home to some of the most brutal and sadistic of Padres. Um, I do want to point out that having looked at all of California and looked at different places, I, I don't know, I, I won't say that the other missions were that much better. Um, so I do think that that we have to consider that it's not like the other missions are great, um, but there is some truth to what they're saying. Uh, obviously there's truth in oral histories because they come from families, right? They come from uh, what they know, uh, but this is verified when we look at some of these Padres. Uh, I'll give a couple quick examples. I don't wanna spend too much time talking about the Padres, um, but I'll point out the, uh, the top one here, uh, Fernandez. Fernandez was a Padre over a mission Santa Clara. Um, he, uh, he was notorious. Uh, in fact, some of the soldiers over there, uh, they complained one time because he had beaten uh, some of the native villagers. In fact, a man who was crippled, he had beaten him nearly to death and he would threaten the villagers to tell them if they did not come in to get their baptism, that he would burn their villages down. The soldiers wrote letters complaining and saying, we need to censure this guy because what happened right afterwards was that native uh, soldiers uh, showed up the next day, warriors, and they had their bows and they were ready to, uh, to wipe them out. Unfortunately, uh, perhaps they didn't do that, uh, and the Spanish did remain, but, um, but this is the type of situation. So what happens after that? Fernandez gets sent over to Santa Cruz right afterwards. Uh, Santa Cruz is a little bit smaller. It's a little more isolated uh, on the coast there. Uh, and so, but what happens there? I find letters a couple months later where he is doing the same exact thing down in Pacaro Valley. It doesn't give as much details, but the same type of thing where he's threatening to burn down villages if people don't come in to convert. Uh, Padre uh, Quintana is probably the most infamous um, he had uh, he was known for being sadistic and cruel. He uh, he ended up uh, having a whip fashioned with iron tips on it so that it would cut deeper. Uh, at one point, he had beaten two young men nearly to death, and this created a situation where the native uh, folks around there, some of these two young men, uh, called together a group of men and women um, who uh, said, "What are we going to do about this guy? We're going to assassinate him. We need to take him out." And they did. In 1812, they gathered together and they assassinated Padre Quintana. Um, there's a lot more detail about that. We just won't get into because there's a lot of things to cover. Um, but um, but that's another one of these stories. Uh, later years, uh, Padre Gil in Tabuada, the oral histories talk about how he would give syphilis to Native women. He was himself uh, suffering some from syphilis and he passed it around. Uh, when I look at the baptismal records, there are a lot of these children who are dying at this point, uh, whose uh, moms eventually are end up dying from syphilis as well, um, right? So, uh, so part of the situation is being passed around from these padres who are there. Uh, and then of course, Real, um, his, his brother is famously documented for raping a woman, a young native woman down at uh, Mission San Carlos. Um, that's been written about um, by Deborah Miranda uh, in really important ways. Um, but his brother was up here, right? And in the oral histories, they say that just like his brother, he was also inclined to vices, especially women. So it leads us to believe that it's very possible that he's also doing the same thing. What I want to show here is a pattern of this going on a mission in Santa Cruz that does verify this. Um, okay. Um, instead, I, I do want to talk a little bit about some prominent Aptos people because, uh, again, it's the, uh, the emphasis is always on uh, the colonials, right? This is the uh, most people know about Padre Quintana, but nobody knows about the native people who are here. Um, well, some prominent uh, Aptos people uh, are in the record books. Um, this one woman, Yunyan, uh, I wrote about her uh, more extensively, but in, you know, very briefly, she was the most prominent uh, of these madrinas, of these godparents, right? She worked a lot with the young native woman within the mission. Uh, her husband was a fellow named Yashaksi. Uh, he was baptized and given the name Donato. Again, I put this in here but to remind us that, again, this process of giving people new names, right? Get, uh, Hispanicizing them, of uh, colonially imposing new names onto them is always uh, ubiquitous. It's always happening in the missions. Um, but Yashaksi was one of the young men who was beaten nearly to death, uh, who called together the people in Quintanas. Uh, Humiliana is another uh, woman. Now her native name is not recorded because she was born at the mission. Uh, so her native name is erased. Uh, I mean, I can guarantee you her parents gave her a native name. Uh, it's just not in the record books. Uh, but uh, she's also involved with this. Her husband uh, was a fellow named Lino. Uh, was also born in the mission. And he's at the center of the story. The Spanish records talk about how he's the one who's uh, being abused by, by Padre Quintana. 
Um, later in 1840s, an oral history that comes through from a Canadian who travels through um, talks about how uh, it's possible that Quintana actually had raped one of the young men's wives, right? So it's possible that Umaliana was the one raped. Uh, it's possible, I was also think it's possible maybe it was Alino who was raped. Uh, we don't quite know, but it does seem like there was some sexual abuse that was happening there as well. Uh, now, Etop is another guy. He was baptized given the name of Alberto Antonio Alberto. Uh, he's one of the only two. There's nine people arrested for the assassination of Quintana. Uh, seven of them died in the presidios, right, in their imprisonment. They're given like 200 to 500 lashings. Uh, and these are, again, like, you know, very severe beatings that they're given. Uh, well, Etop is, is one, the only one who's actually able to get himself out of there. He's able to um, somehow testify that he wasn't involved with this, and they do let him out. And the only records he shows up is he shows up living in the outskirts of Big Sur area. Uh, and in the two records he shows up, they, they make a point to say that he's living out in the peripheries. He's not living anywhere near this. And we can all imagine exactly why he chose to live as far away from the Spanish as he could. Uh, one last Aptos person we're talking about is a woman named Barbara. Again, we don't have her native name recorded, um, but she lived on the west side of Santa Cruz near what is Westlake Pond right now. She was married to a fellow named Shigiut, uh, who was baptized as Geronimo. And they, uh, they, this is in the post-mission period when the mission finally closed. Some native people were able to live in areas around the mission. Uh, and this family lived up there. They were very famous at the time. There's a lot written about Geronimo in particular. Um, and they lived until about 1850. Um, but at much of the west side was native land. Uh, everything is native land. Let me correct that. Um, but after the mission closed, much of the west side of Santa Cruz was uh, still uh, lived on by native people uh, up until about 1850 or so when the increasing number of Americans, of course, displaced everyone. Um, and what was the remaining community lived down in the Potrero area. Um, okay, so let me um, say two brief words here. Uh, want to be mindful of time, um, but a couple of brief words about the American period, because I think we've spoken a lot about the Spanish period, um, but I don't think people realize uh, in general that the American period was even worse um, in many ways, right? Like we talked about the Spanish did, even though so many people, 90% of people are dying, um, it, it became even worse in the American period. The genocide became an official US policy. For those who haven't read Ben Madley's book, uh, an American genocide, uh, it's a must read. Uh, there are actually a lot of other studies out there. Uh, it's not the first time it's talked about, but he did put it all together. Um, but millions of dollars were paid by US government for militias and for massacres, reimbursements for scalp bounties. Um, There's an act to protect Indians, it was called in 1850. And this basically legalized child indenture. So in theory, somebody, not in theory, actually, in, in actuality, people would kill the parents and they would take the children, put them in their homes and make them work. Uh, and this was perfectly legal. In fact, it, it was it was legal beyond the end of the uh, Civil War when people in California realized, oh, wait a minute, we have slavery here. Uh, we have to shift this. And they did. But that didn't mean that people were given freedom. They were still in these homes. Again, I mentioned uh, Fremont earlier. Um, you know, just to, if people want to look it up later, in 1846 was the Sacramento River Massacre. And this is the massacre I was referencing. He killed a couple hundred Wintu people, uh, who was mostly uh, women and children at the time. And it was a massacre. It wasn't a battle. There were no shots fired in the other direction. And this was uh, commonplace at the time. This is one of many things. And again, as a reminder, Fremont Peak uh, does have a name, Toyotak, right? the place of the bumblebees. Um, OK, so let me. Um, kind of bring it towards towards a closing here, last few minutes, a couple of things. First of all, I do want to bring it up again. I did send this before, but uh, when we think of the kind of consecutive uh, waves of genocide that happened here in California, in Santa Cruz, um, I do want to remind people that when you hear native speakers, like you've heard earlier tonight with the two speakers before me, uh, speaking about things, I, I do think it's really important to recognize that um, the the, the history of genocide that people have endured, right? And the, the people who are here speaking today, who are, you're getting the opportunity to listen to, are here because their ancestors have endured this, because they have uh, fought hard over, over the centuries to make it through to this point. And I think it's really important to acknowledge. I think that uh, I wanna encourage people to go out and go support Native people more today, listen to Native people, uh, and start thinking about uh, who are the Native people, as Kenny pointed out with that app or anything else, learn the history of where you are, of the people who were, who, who lived and survived in this area and who endured. Um, I also want to, um, you know, I was going to say a couple of things, maybe I'll say a little bit, but I, th I think Kutcher did a really amazing job of, of taking apart this idea that, um, that uh, 
you know, this uh, man of his time type of idea. Um, I just want to, I also want to agree that, you know, there are always people who are fighting against this, who are challenging this at this time. Um, you know, th this kind of argument is, is really kind of an absurd argument, right? There are always contemporary people who are fighting against colonialism and challenging it. So if we can only judge, if we can't judge uh, these people, how can we judge the other people? And secondly, of course, as a historian, we do judge history. I mean, that's why we study history. I mean, that's the whole point of it, right? We, we learn from the past to not repeat it, right? I mean, isn't that the, the old saying, right? So I think that idea of leaving things in history is, is kind of a ridiculous one. Um, uh, a couple things about, uh, you know, this name change thing. I do, I do think it's important for people to think about, um, you know, what is the value of having a name in something? Is this name here, is it teaching people history? Is it helping people to understand an area or a land or a history? Uh, or is it erasing this history, right? And in the case of Cabrillo, he came by in the 1500s. You know, the Spanish arrived here in the 1769. So it's even, even the fact of having Cabrillo, who's 200 years before the colonial period even begins, it, it further obscures this, this indigenous history, right? It, it pushes back this, this colonial idea of when, uh, when Santa Cruz began as, as kind of the contemporary period or the, the colonial period as we think of it, right? Um, so I think these are these are important things to think about. And think about the Aptos people. The Aptos people were here uh, at least seven, eight hundred years as Aptos people, thousands of years, uh, you know, their ancestors in this area too. We're looking at a period of 250 years since uh, since uh, 1769, right? It's a very brief period. So um, you know, there's a much longer history. Um, and the last thing I, I want to end on is is bringing up a point. I don't want to talk too much about the previous speaker from a couple of weeks ago, but uh, you know there was a point that was brought up about, uh, and I hear this often today: of we cannot change the past, right? Renaming of Cabrillo is is not going to change the past. Uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, the, you cannot change the past. But the thing about this is, a this is not what we're talking about here in a situation like this. It's true that we cannot change the past. But it's also very important to recognize that we're very much still living with the legacies of colonialism and of genocide. Uh, these legacies are very much alive today. Uh, we're all living in the shadow of the atrocities of this history. Uh, we know the historical trauma. Now people are studying historical trauma and transgenerational traumas. I mean, these are, these are things that stick around right, for all of us, right? We're all products of this history one way or the other. Uh, and until we deal with this, until we uh, start engaging with this, this history, um, then we're not going to be able to move through it. And so the way to move forward through this is to heal, right? I mean, if we want to do that, and the way to heal is to look at the hard truths of history and the hard truths of colonialism. Uh, so while changing a name or changing something is not going to change the past, it's, it's really up to us today to decide how we choose to deal with these legacies. And the choice is ours. We can choose to ignore and to justify them, as some do, uh, or we can choose to deal with them. And if we're going to choose to deal with them, that's going to require that we be honest about our history and we be honest uh, about the work that we need to do to make amends. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez, uh, Dr. Kutch, uh, Rizling Bali, and Canyon Sayers Roots. Uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, we have a set of questions that are in the Q&A, and I want to encourage participants who are in the Zoom room uh, and attending tonight, if you have a question for one of our panelists, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Uh, Kristen Fabos and I will, will get around to some of those questions as we move forward here. I want to start uh, first to remind people that we have a survey that we'd like you to complete at the end of this uh, to determine how much you might have learned tonight. Uh, and also to get some of your feedback on this uh, panel that we've, um, this series of panels that we're doing. So one question I wanted to start with that I saw in the Q&A was going back to the earlier presentation by Dr. Riesling Baldi on um, the, the photo that you had of Toy Purina and that incredible story and maybe the source of where you have that photo from and, and maybe some sources that people might turn to to learn more about uh, this incredible woman. Yeah, so there there are no like actual photos, renderings, or portraits of Toy Perina. So the things that we use are mostly um, artists' interpretations of what she may have looked like, sometimes based on their knowledges of the peoples of the place or their own family histories, um, or even their ideas. Maybe they dreamed her 
into being, right? And like what she may look like for them. And I think the multiple different artist renderings of her are important because she en encompasses and, 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 and moves through so many different ways of being for people. Um, so I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call it like an archival document. I would call it like how people are taking her story as they hear it and learn about it and interpreting it and then making it meaningful to um, what we understand today about her. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think a lot of the work that I've seen that has been really um, well done on Toy Purina is actually by the Tongva people. If you uh, look up on like their websites and the things that they're publishing, um, they're doing a lot to share information that they have on her uh, and sort of the things that you should know about her. Um, and again, like some of it is oral history. Some of it is based on um, like the, they have these, the documented rec records of her testimony because when she was caught, and so their, their, their rise, their, their rising up against the mission was actually thwarted. There's a really fascinating story, by the way, behind who, like who thwarted that and what happened post that. Um, but it was thwarted and then she was put on trial and they do have, um, actual uh, transcripts of her trial. But the issue is that um, it was it, she had to be translated because she only spoke in her native language. So the there was a soldier that translated what she said to the people who were asking the questions. But he was the actual soldier who had thwarted the whole thing. So he was able to maybe translate in a way that he's interpreting what she's saying, right? He's, it might not actually be her words, but it might actually be her words. Like, so you have to kind of do a little bit of what um, Sadia Hartman calls critical fabulation. You have to look into the archives and be able to tell a story based on what you understand, what you, what you envision, what you see, what you've lived, what you know about indigenous women, about indigenous peoples, that sort of thing. Um, and I highly encourage you like to look into her as a person to understand that she's actually a really foundational person to what we understand about the state of California, uh, because the soldier who thwarted the efforts for her to take to take down the mission, he ends up getting awarded with whiteness as a result of this action by the Spanish, like that by the Spanish governors. They start writing about him like he's white. He's actually an African soldier. He's like a part African soldier. And they start writing and saying he's white and he can own property now. And it ends up that his son becomes the first governor of, um, of, of Spanish and then Mexican California. His name was Pio Pico. He's very famous, but it's because they thwarted this indigenous woman's effort that they become the richest family in California. And so there's a real connection between Toy Farina and what happens in the history of California that people don't know. And she gets exiled to a different mission uh, because of this action. And the men who followed her into battle, they get punished for, go for trying to take down the mission. They get punished a second time for following a woman into battle because they're trying to like change how we understand our own cultural positioning. So there's all these really amazing things about her that I think people should know, but they need to know that from the Tongva people because they're the ones that can really tell you about the stories that get passed down through their generations. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, I don't know if you wanna to turn to the next question in our list. Sure, I see a couple have been answered in the chat, but there is one open remaining that says um, from Andre Laborvo, what is the name of the archives that Dr. Martinez is referring to? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there's a lot of archives. Uh, so, um, oh, I'm trying to think of what that might have been a reference to. Um, I think that I think I was referencing some of the, the missionaries letters, right, that talk about the kind of the um, emptying of a village site. I mean, so these are, a lot of these are uh, kept down in Santa Barbara, the, the Mission uh, Archive Library. Um, but there's stuff in archives all over. I spent a lot of time archival research in uh, Mexico City. There's a decent amount of stuff that was sent down there, right? So these are colonial archives. 
uh, which is a whole other interesting topic. But um, you know, the the documents are collected uh, in certain areas. Sacramento, of course, is home to a lot of the American era documents. Uh, I've seen stuff in there, I and mean, there's letters about these petitions for uh, Indian um, children, right, to uh, the indenture. I mean, there's a bunch of these letters that are up in these documents where you read uh, people are, you know, talking about, hey, I, I see this kid and I want him to work in my home, uh, you know, and, and you, you have to wonder about the circumstances behind uh, this petition and these these things there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's quite a few different uh, archives all around. Um, I, you know, if you don't mind, I'll just to kind of, follow uh, what uh, Dr. Rosling Bali was saying too about Toy Perina. You know, it's uh, absolutely that story is so interesting in so many levels that she was talking about, but I think it's uh, really interesting that, that it's not the only situation, right? I think in uh, locally, uh, I talked about the assassination of Padre Quintana, but when you look really closely at that story, it turns out that there's a woman, uh, a woman named uh, Yakenensai, uh, who is at the heart of this, right? Uh, the oral histories all point out that she was the one who came up with the strategy on how to kill him. She was the one who lured uh, Padre Quintana out of uh, out of his place. And in fact, to the point where the young men who were supposed to kill him refused to do it twice. Uh, this same woman, Yakenesai, was the one who said to them in the oral histories that are handed down, she turned to them and said, hey, if you do not um, do what you've promised, I'm going to kind of alert him to this whole thing. And so she was really at the center of the whole story who strategized it. And the fascinating thing is that, um, you know, so it, it points to the role that Native women played as leadership, but it also points because she was not arrested with the men who were arrested. And I think that in this uh, kind of interesting way, the Spanish could not conceive of a woman as being the, the mastermind behind this story because of the patriarchal system that they were bringing with them. Uh, so anyway, there's there's a lot of other stories too um, of women like Toy Perina, like your Ken inside. Um, anyway, just to kind of throw that out there too. I'm going to paraphrase a question that I think is um, in the Q&A from uh, Margarita Correa about um, kind of getting you to think about what would a, a name and maybe an appropriate name be if we were to think about a, an institution of higher education uh, from the traditions of, of the tribes that you've mentioned and um, sort of get you thinking about what would a name be if we were to change it to something else. And that may be asking too much of you. You may not want to, you may not want to venture into it. But. I always say you have to ask the tribal peoples of the place what they would like to name it because that 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 ability to name it was was taken from them. And and that's like the first step to how you 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 decide like how do you name something? And the other thing I'll say is it likely already has a name. I mean, very likely already has a name and, and it doesn't, whether or not they don't use, like we don't use it all the time. I will say the land remembers its name. Uh, the land knows its name. It knows what it's supposed to be called. It will remember when people start calling it by its name and it might, it will wake up so many things because, and people will start remembering all kinds of things around that. They might remember stories they forgot. They might remember, they might have dreams they didn't even know they had. They might find things that they didn't even know were possible just because you're saying the words out loud. Vine Deloria Jr. talks about a lot of things, but what he says is like, we don't, we didn't pick names lightly. We didn't pick sacredness. Sacredness was, it existed. It just was what it, and we identified it because we could feel the way that the earth was feeling, we were in a different place with understanding that. So our names were based on how we understood our place. And uh, and it remembers. Um, my One of my colleagues always talks about how in Hoopa, like when you say you're lost in our language, you're like, I'm lost. You don't actually say that. What you say is, the land doesn't know me. Like that's what you're saying. You're saying the land doesn't know me. And when you know your land, then you know, you're never lost. And so I feel like you have to kind of rebuild that that moment, that relationship to know your land. And that's gonna come from how you work with your tribal peoples to decide what that looks like. I, I think that's great. I would just to add a couple thoughts and I think more concerns. I think my concern with, you know, even if it were to approach, you know, the Muslim people around and say, you know, hey, what are names? My concern is that um, until, 
as far as I know, I only know of two professors at, at Cabrillo who actually are teaching about Native history and are teaching about the local history uh, about that, right? Uh, Stan Rushworth, Dusty McKenzie, there's probably others I'm not aware of, but um, but I think that my fear would be that to, there would be another colonial act, right? It's like, let's, let's get a great indigenous name to put on this place. And yet let's not shift to be kind of interrogating colonialism on a, on a more systemic level. Uh, you know, let's not be doing this on a, you know, a uh, roundabout way. So, so I guess that's, that's my thoughts on that. I, I think, you know, I loved what, what you just said, but uh, I th those are my concerns, right? Is I think that, I think that there, people could enthusiastically say, hey, let's look for uh, name of something, but then kind of further perpetuate kind of a colonial erasure as well, so. Thank you. Kristen, maybe you could ask one more question and that can wrap up tonight's session. Sure. There is a question from John Govsky asking, is there anything the college can do to help the Amamitsun tribe in the fight for full federal recognition? Um, I obviously cannot speak for the Amamitsun. I, I am very good friends with Val Lopez and, uh, and have worked closely with them. I mean, I think that's a great question to talk to them about. I will say, because I've heard Val say this a lot um, publicly and uh, commonly, but I, my understanding is that the tribe has shifted from the struggle for recognition to focus on building uh, relations and connections with uh, land management, uh, which they are doing phenomenal things with. So uh, right now they're co-managing Kid Rosta Valley in multiple places. Uh, with state parks, but with other, you know, other partnerships as well. Uh, so, so anyway, but I think it's, I mean, I think that if the school wants to reach out to them, I think that would be a great idea and to other local Native peoples and find ways to support them. But I guess I would encourage you to, to ask, hey, what are ways that we can support what you want to support rather than um, necessarily having like a preconceived, like, you know, we want to help you with this, because that may not, may or may not be the goal of what they're trying to do. Those are my thoughts. I'll just say what I say to everyone when they say, well, what can we do? Uh, give the land back. That's what you can do. Um, give it all, give it back. Uh, oh no, what does that mean? If you wanna know, look it up. You can Google my name and land back. A whole bunch of stuff will come up. I will tell you, it is possible. It is really awesome. Uh, it has happened in our region when Tuluat got returned to the Wiat people. Uh, and then what I love about it, what I keep saying to people is like, it got given back on Wednesday and then like the next day was Thursday and everybody was really happy about it. There was not like this, it was not like, oh no, the world's over. Um, so I feel like it just was a really great moment for all of us. And uh, people always say, well, don't we have to do a bunch of stuff before we give the land back? Like first we'll do a land acknowledgement and then second we'll do better curriculum and then third, nah, give it back and then do a land acknowledgement and curriculum and stuff like that. Like start with that um, and, and, and then say out loud that you could do that because the minute you start talking about it, the more obvious it becomes. Well, thank you both. And thank you also Canyon for being here. Um, I just wanna close with some wrapping up comments and remind folks that we have uh, upcoming events. We have another, um, session scheduled actually next Thursday, April 15th, Dr. Sandy Leiden will be presenting uh, a retired historian, um, history dude, we like to call him from this area, on uh, how Cabrillo got its name, uh, college got its name, and uh, from the period of the 1959 founding of the college. So a really um, interesting session that's planned for next Thursday, again at six o'clock, I've posted into the, the chat, the address for our name exploration website, uh, and so feel free to visit there. Again, I'd encourage you to fill out the um, survey for tonight to let us know how much you've learned and how much um, you've enjoyed tonight's session as well. And let me close by thanking Canyon Sayers Roods, uh, Dr. Kocha Risling Baldi, and Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us tonight. Uh, and I appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. And we'll close the session tonight. Thank you all. Thank you again, everyone. Super job, really um, wonderful. I learned a lot tonight, so I'm very appreciative of everything. Yeah, thank you so much. That was so powerful. So, so powerful. I took down a lot of notes. And you know, we we're doing some murals at Cabrillo and I was thinking of 
you know, the ones that you shared. Oh my gosh. Top, Topi Purina. I don't yeah. know, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name well, but wow, that would be great to incorporate. We're hoping to do about four. We don't have any murals. We have one in the works in the pipeline, but we're hoping to build ethnic studies down the line and maybe represent the different ethnic groups. 